the performance of the QuantLib library, which is not to be confused with LibQuantum. Um, it's uh, quantitative finance stuff, but it's a, it's a big C++ library with a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, profiling, I ran into the fact that there's, there's the dynamic cast mechanism is doing a string comparison to make sure that it's really, really the types are really have the same name. Um, and, but it's like deep under the hoods of, of, of all this C++ code, and um, it's always it's always the same thing, and we know what the what the string is, and so not having to do uh, you know a PLT call into glibc in the middle of that is is uh, is advantageous. So, and then plus, well, I'd make the joke. I like to make the joke about uh, uh, the Unix kernel to a first approximation is bcopy, um, but there there. I couldn't find an attribution to that. I mean, no, that's like a really old joke, right? It's B copy, not mem copy, so it's got to be really old. Um, I couldn't find an attribution for that one, or I would have put it in the talk. So instead, it could just be hearsay. Um, but there's other, you know, there's there's other programs and libraries that uh, uh, that make heavy use of string compares and, and and things like that. And of course, mem compare is used. Lots of places, and then the, the final piece is um, if we do this in expand, then the guts of string compare are laid open for all the RTL optimizations to mess about. And so, if we don't screw up, then things could actually be even faster. And the disadvantage, of course, is you you can make the code gigantic if you go and expand a whole bunch of these things. And so, the the trade off I've generally made is to limit the limit the length of strings that we uh, that, that will do the expansion or so that you're not generating more than, you know, a few dozen extra instructions uh, compared to a string compare call. Um, so I had to decide how to measure, test and measure something. So the idea is, well, do a tight loop with a string compare in it and just basically see how many of these things you can do in an interval of time. And so the, you know, the one version of this, th it's the same code, just compiled compiled two different ways. So you can use dash m, no built-in string compare or whatever, to, to turn off the, the, the built-in expansion, in which case that will just be a, a you know, a library call versus, um, you know, leave it on and it, and it mem compare in this case um, for the example. Um, and, you know, <coughs> So that I don't always have to test this on a, some dedicated benchmark system, I just take a bunch of samples and throw out the throw out the slow ones, which are usually when you know the, the thread got swapped or somebody else started to make dash j fifty or something like that. Um, so that's the that's the testing methodology. I started started hacking on this back in GCC seven um, to do at first mem compare. And that's the basic code expansion. So obviously, this is a lot bigger than. That, that's why I was talking about the code size. This is a lot bigger than a, a call to a library, right? Which is usually about three instructions or something like that. Maybe a few more if you got to marshal a few arguments. Uh, but it's still not. It's still not a huge amount. Um, so it's it, and it's not a huge amount of branches either. Um, but one point I make about branches, and Sahar and I were just talking about this beforehand, is that you were expanding this in a specific place in the code where there may be specific patterns to the string that's being compared there. And so most machines have, you know, the branch prediction mechanism can say, well, I can make things about this branch in particular, right? And so now that branch, instead of being buried in the library, where it's the same for everything that's using string compare, it's just this one instance. And so, you know, if that one instance always fails in the first comparison because the strings are different, then you predict that branch and it's even faster. So, uh, what's the bottom line? This is a multiple of speed, right? So, it's a really short string, it's like five times faster. Um, and, and, and tapering down there. So this is mem compare on a power eight back when I was doing this for GCC seven. And so as you see, it, it kind of tapers off. The um, this 
this is comparing it, com comparing it to the glibc implementation. So, it, it, you know, how I do relative to them depends on who's got the latest instructions in when. And so I'm usually, uh, some, some of these benchmarks were like on a, on a Red Hat system, Red Hat Enterprise, so it's like an old glibc, right? So they don't, it doesn't necessarily have the, the latest uh, uh, fancy instructions in there. So like, what did I use? I, there wasn't anything, there's nothing particular fancy about this one. This is the GPR version, just using GPR registers, not, not vector or anything. Um, there isn't a huge amount of difference. The align thing there is how the um, how the strings are, are are each of the strings is aligned. So um, if you look at uh, if you look at the test harness, uh, I sort of sort of uh, uh, you know hint this to GCC by putting it in this way. So GCC can figure out that the alignment of this thing is going to be a certain, you know, it's going to be one, one byte aligned or it's going to be two byte aligned because we have this, this, you know, so if I have 16 times something plus A, which it knows the alignment of A, then GCC is smart enough to figure out that this, this whole argument here has an alignment of 16. So that's just to sort of telegraph it, okay, I'm doing this, and so then that ends up in, in expand. Then when I look at what the alignment of the arguments to the built-in mem copy are, or mem compare, that's uh, that that will come through there. Uh, then this is the this is the same thing in GCC seven, but for for string compare, string and compare. Um, there, I had to educate myself on the library issues, things like crossing four K boundaries. Um, because mem compare, it's obvious that you have to read. Oh, you want the mic? Well, <laughs> oh, there's the mics. Yeah, see, that's the thing. The library, I, I just went by what glibc is doing, right? So uh, the, the, the minimum the page size know. of our PC is 4K. Yeah, but it, it, it's the page crossing issues. Yeah, it's, it's the page it's crossing the issues. So you have to pick something that's a minimum yeah. that it could possibly be, right? So like 4K in this case. Because, yeah, we do mostly use 64K pages. But um, I don't think this actually hurts that much because it's not that often that you actually hit this. Most of the time it's in the middle of the page somewhere. But you, 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 you can't go and do that. Obviously, for mem compare, it doesn't matter because, by definition, you have to read the whole thing. So uh, every, byte, every byte matters. So, uh, that's, that, that, so anyways, that's, that's what this is up at the top. You bail out to string compare if, um, uh, if, it, if it looks like it's going to the, cross the 4K boundary. Um, and other, otherwise, um, because we don't have a sort of specific string compare instruction for GPRs on power, and we'll, I'll get to that later for the vector stuff, you have to do two comparisons. One is comparing the two things to each other, and then you, you can compare one of them to zero, and then combine those, combine those two comparisons to figure out whether you hit either a zero or a difference. And you only have to compare one of them to the zero because you can convince yourself that if the other one was and, and the first string was not, then you get a difference a, as well. So, uh, and then the, uh, the count leading zero trickery down there is just to figure out which byte is actually different so that you can extract that and, and, and then uh, fig figure out the correct string compare result. And this, this is one of these cases where I could, uh, I could beat up a little bit on, on glibc in some cases because, um, a, as you can see, this one wasn't really converging, especially for the, the small alignment cases. So for large, for large alignments, well, that's still a factor of like almost four faster there. 
Um, so, but I mean, I still have to cut things off at, at uh, somewhere between 32 and 64 bytes to keep from generating, you know, hundreds of ins instructions there because this is just generating a linear sequence of instructions. It's not a loop yet, which um, will actually be the next thing that I'll get to. So on GCC8, I said, well, okay, we have to start generating some loop code because um, obviously from that last graph, it would make sense to be able to do some longer strings because even the ones that do converge, you want to get out to 128 bytes or, 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 or more to try to cover the performance gap between doing something in an inline expansion versus making the call to the library. I mean, the library call can obviously be specialized in a whole lot of ways and use a variety of tricks, but that call overhead is a, is a big hump to get over. And so that's, that's where I was motivated to, uh, to try to generate loops. So uh, Sayer and I were just talking about this because I haven't actually picked out the, whether there's a complete performance benefit to this or not, but I had to teach GCC about the PowerPC branch decrement, not zero, and and a comparison bit because it's a branch that tests two things at once, right? It's, it's, did you, you know, after the decrement, was it zero or not? And, and by the way, also look at this at this condition bit. Um, so in that in that way, you can, you know, it's a it's a branch decrement loop to do the loop part, but it's also the second comparison because the loop is unrolled by two, so that's why there's four loads and, and two sets of compares. Uh, and so the second comparison is combined with the, the loop test. Um, and this is, the, this is the P9 code here that's shown because it's got this, uh, this set B instruction which takes the place of, um, of a bunch of messing around because the way that uh, string compare result is defined, it's defined as a 32-bit result. Um, or actually, this is mem compare. Mem compare is defined the same way. So the problem is, it's a 32-bit result. You could do it like in the PA code. It does a subtract, uh, a, a sub dot, you know, to set the condition code, and and the subtract result would be the result from the mem compare, right? Because that's less than, equal, or greater than zero. But the problem is, you want a 32-bit less than equal or greater than zero and so converting from a 64-bit one to a 32-bit one takes a little bit of messing around. So this is the this is another future work piece is to see whether it makes any sense to teach GCC further how to use those branch decrement uh, plus comparison bit instructions because that was a that was a new pattern that I had to add to GCC because it, it never used those before. Uh, which led to some interesting adventures, including the the splitter for what do you do with that branch decrement true if the if the branch is out of range or uh, you know a, uh, a, a anyway. So then now you have to re now you end up having to reverse that, and you've got two two different comparisons because you've got the it, it's it's a mess as you can imagine. I didn't get it right the first time. I had a, I had one thing, and then uh, I finally ran into a test case where there was a string or a, like a mem compare inside some gigantic loop code that actually ran that was larger than the conditional branch distance. Uh, so the loop, though, was kind of disappointing performance-wise. Um, I went to the effort of making the loop code be able to handle the case where you had an unknown uh, length, so the length wasn't a thing that GCC could figure out was a constant, um, which would seem fairly obvious because you could, you know, you could compute the loop bounds and do the cleanup and whatnot and do it, but the performance was not really that much better than glibc in that case, so I, basically that, that code is still in GCC, but it's disabled because it didn't make any sense to use it. I mean, a lot of, 
a lot of what is enabled and disabled for this stuff is just basically me doing some performance tests and figuring out, okay, how much code bloat can I justify? Because that was, of course, the first thing that anybody would beat me up about on, on you know, on GCC patches. And is the performance, you know, what point does the performance drop off? So then it's, it's usually between 32 and 64, but in the case of this, it made sense, like on P9, it will generate loops all the way out to 192 bytes comparison, because that's where you're, you're about at the break even leave level, and you might as well, you might as well just call glibc at that point. Uh, let's see. So then the next thing was uh, to go start looking at vector instructions because, of course, they're they're nifty and they do twice as much work for instructions. So that means we can compare twice as much string uh, with the same number of added instructions. Uh, plus, <coughs> P9 has this whole nifty set of instructions for doing a string compare. V, C, M, P, N, E, Z, B does a vector comparison to 16 byte quantities and it compares them for equality and not zero. So if you're doing a string compare, it's exactly what you want because it will, the result register, each byte will, you know, be a zero or FF depending on whether the two things were equal or if either of them or both of them were equal to a zero. And then, uh, and then you just, there's a, let's see. What do I, this is the count leading zeros, where is that? Okay. Yeah, so it's a count, there's the count leading zeros by uh, bytes, like the LSB of each byte is, <laughs> so it ends up, it ends up figuring out which byte your difference is in, and then there's an inst extract instruction that extracts it that byte from the vector register into a GPR, and then you could just do a sub, the, the sub app. So it's, somebody was actually paying attention to what you might actually want in a vector instruction to do a string compare um, in the ISA design. It wasn't me, I had no involvement in that, so I don't know who was doing that, but somebody was on, on point. Um, P8 was a bit messier, but I figured out a way, a clever way to do this using the, uh, gather bits to bytes um, instruction, which is really bizarre and wonderful. <laughs> Actually, Sayer helped a lot in this. A lot of these sequences were cooked up with Sayer and I messing around on a, on a Slack channel or on a, but at the time we were all using um, ARC, I guess. But So the performance of these is pretty, pretty darn good. Um, so, uh, it, it's another one of these cases where it's, it never, uh, I mean, I think th th this, this may improve as, as glibc adds better code. <laughs> Tulio's looking at me over there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, if you add sort of asthmatotic to two times faster, right? So, obviously, the next, one of the next things, one of the many next things I need, should do, is and my loop code does not generate VSX code, so it should uh, I should get that figured out um, because that's a sort of obvious obvious combination to be able to do even more of this stuff. Um, then <coughs> I alluded to this at the beginning, but the cool thing is because you blast all this stuff in at expand, then you have taken string compare and you've laid the whole thing open because except for the P8, the BDD, that is obviously an unspec because I wouldn't even want to try to write that in RTL. It's a kind of like a bits to bytes transpose. <laughs> I don't even know how you would do that. It would be ugly. Um, so a bunch of stuff uh, can be optimized in interesting ways. And of course, this leads to interesting bugs when I didn't properly state in the RTL all the assumptions that I was make, that, that, that you could make about how this is supposed to work. I didn't explicitly state in the RTL, and so then some part of the optimizer would, something downstream would, would 
take the fact that I didn't say you couldn't do that, <laughs> it would do something that was, uh, that, that would lead you getting the wrong result. And that's sort of my list of things that I ran into. That second one I talked about, um, I discovered at some point that we really, I really need to put the branch probability notes on all the branches that I generate in this thing because otherwise the things that are ordering code and deciding, you know, which way branches might go will will make stupid decisions based, up, based upon that because they don't have any understanding of, you know, which way the which way these branches are supposed to go. Uh, I ended up fixing the, the, the B-swap 2 uh, because that really didn't do a very good job of trying to make use of the fact that this LDBRX was an indexed load. So that, by the way, I didn't, I didn't really mention about what that was about. It's just if you're doing little Indian code, you want, <coughs> you want to load the Native Big Indian is actually more like really the order that you want for um, uh, for for these uh, for the string comparisons in particular because the first first byte in the register the high high order byte you want to be the first byte in the string so that's the Big Indian order so in Little Indian order you get the opposite thing and then that's not really so helpful, so but fortunately we have those byte reverse. Um, <coughs> and then Power 6 didn't like um, XForm instructions, these index instructions, and uh, I, I ran into issues with, I was generating RTL that looked like an, that looked like an index form instruction, but with that avoid X form, then that was assuming that you weren't going to be generating any RTL that looked like index form instructions, and so then you you that leads to an ice somewhere in the compiler because you've kind of disabled these patterns. But now I'm not using the pattern, and I generated something that looks like that, and nothing matches. Um, and then set mem size when you access this had to do with um, what was it? I didn't even talk about this. One of the optimizations that I figured out you could do on power 8 and 9 is that if, say, I'm trying to compare 15 bytes, <coughs> rather than doing a sequence for, for GPR, actually it works for, for VSX as well, uh, but let's use the GPR example. So I could load eight bytes, and I could load four bytes, and then I could load two bytes, and I could load one byte, and I could do all those comparisons. That's way, that's way my work. So it's much easier to load eight bytes and then offset by seven and load another eight bytes so that it ends where the chunk is that you're supposed to end, but there's a single byte in there that's being compared twice, but that doesn't really matter. So, um, and it turns out B7 doesn't like that very well performance-wise, but P8 and P9 don't really care. The performance is just as good. And I mean, that, that was one enabling enabling piece that makes makes for more compact code. Um, another enabling piece that it, I really should have called out here is the fact that on all three of those machines, P7, 8, and 9, unaligned loads um, don't really have much of a performance penalty there. And that's what really makes all this go because I don't have to look at at the at alignment and trying to get aligned, any of that stuff would have made this a total non-starter for expanding this inline because you don't want to have to do all those cases and branch code and all that stuff expanding inline. It would double the amount of code that you generated and and it would it would not make it worth it. Plus, it would it will double the amount of time it takes to write the <laughs> the code and expand to generate the code right because you're writing. It's, it's meta in expand, right? Because you're not just like writing some instructions in inline assembly. You're writing code that generates RTL that represents the instructions you think you want to have at the end, which of course that's assuming that nothing get op nothing actually optimized anything, that's what you would end up with. But uh, So the, the more 
the more complicated the code that you're trying to generate with more branches and things, the more complicated it is to generate. Like, like okay, that's that's like a tautology or something. Um, and then finally, this is the this is the stuff that I have been working on for P or for GCC ten, which is uh, I'm trying to tackle mem mem copy mem move. This the thing. The first thing that I fixed was uh, we had we had a, a an op tab pattern called uh, uh, move mem, but that was actually a mem copy, not equivalent to the library mem move. So that would have been an extremely confusing thing to have gone forward to, especially if we were trying to expand both of those to have the names be reversed in the patterns versus what the library does in terms of the semantics. So I made this stupid monster patch that touched 29 <laughs> different targets <laughs> to change all the names. Um, but that's in, and so the next piece I need to do is, is actually fix the independent code so that it will try to do the expand for both of those. Because um, we got some nifty stuff in there already because there is, on the Gimple side, we have code that will look at the arguments to a mem move, and it will determine if they are, if it can prove that they are not overlapping, then it will change that to a mem copy. So, in other words, what we end up with at expand time is if it says mem move, it really is, we can't, we couldn't prove that it wasn't. Um, so that's 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 kind of nice, but it would be nice to actually be able to expand some of those in line because right now we do not expand those at all ever. Um, we do have expansions for BEM copy. The one for PowerPC is kind of simple and stupid. It just basically loads a bunch of stuff into registers and then stores it all in the new location. So I think the funny thing is that would actually work for a MEM move as opposed to a MEM copy, even though. That's not what it actually was. So there was a lot of confusion there, but I'm, I'm working through that, and I hope I hope I can get the time this fall to, to get some of that into GCC 10. And I'm about out of voice, and I've <laughs> been charging through this. What time is it? And it's only it's only 2:30. So does anybody have any questions or suggestions or what what did I what did I forget to talk about? All right, where's the where, somebody get this man a mic. So um, memcopy is very different from memcomp in the in terms of uh, device memory access. So I think for for memcomp you don't need to support device memory. With, right. And for memcopy, there are, I think on power like on other targets there are specific requirements that you can operate on device memory with memcopy, and that sort of restricts what you can. Yep. do in terms of optimizations. We've already dealt with some of this. There are already patches that I put into GCC 9 to change what uh, what instructions it was generating to do to do that 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 move mem expansion that was there. So we we changed what that will 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 generate so that it's not generating the, any of the instructions that we were not supposed to use for device memory. So yeah, definitely. Okay, so my, my concern is that uh, we, we have these, this constraint on the glibc side, and if you start inlining memcopy no, in the we, compiler, then... My, <laughs> yeah. and, and my answer is no, we, our feet are held to the same fire. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're fettered with the same chains, so we're not going to, they're not going to let us do anything for that, that that you wouldn't be allowed to do. You brought this up uh, to us a while back, and we listened. <laughs> so we got it fixed. <laughs> and how generic is these optimizations? Uh, how hard would be to actually test and implement in another architecture? Oh, uh, it, it's not. It wouldn't really be that. That, I mean, any any other. Uh, uh, one of the motivating pieces for this is having, if the call overhead is relatively expensive to call, to call into the library, any other architecture that had that 
situation, it, you know, you could you could copy the code that I that I have and just basically, you know, co copy the, the 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 concepts and just change the RTO that you're generating so that you're generating the RTO, the instructions for that target architecture, um, you know, for whatever sequence you want to use for doing a mem compare. Yeah, it, it's it's applicable definitely. I mean, and a lot of architectures already do have uh, uh, do have patterns uh, for for the move mem, and there was a there was a pattern for a, there's a pattern for the string compare, and so there are a couple that that do have things for that. I mean, one of the patches I had to do when I first got started with this is there was there was an independent code issue that prevented it from trying to um, do the expand the inline the built-in expand if one of the strings was not a constant string. So in other words, if you knew, but I want I wanted to see all all of these things and, and be able to reject them in my in my pattern rather than have the independent code just say well one of these isn't a constant string so don't even try to do this expansion pattern. So when I fixed that, then I discovered x86 had a had a uh, compare string SI pattern that, but that it was actually not quite correct. So that when you passed it two things that were not constant, it uh, it would fail in some cases. And so I had to do a patch to fix that before I could put in that uh, that other patch. So there are other architectures that have some of these patterns already. Just I kind of went nuts with this. Yeah, and I think the, the benefit um, is not just from the call overhead standpoint, but I think it was a really good point that he made that modern architectures need really good branch prediction and being able to force uh, this out for individual mem copies and, and so forth, mem compares is, is really valuable in terms of uh, performance of this stuff. But my question was more uh, if, if, if this code is organized in the way that I don't need actually to copy the algorithm that we implement to, to dump this LTR code, but instead I add hooks to my architecture to say, oh, use this instruction to read the memory, use this, use this instruction to compare, and use this instruction to branch. Well, there, there is already some architecture in the independent code because it has this compare by pieces stuff, which I don't completely understand why there, it doesn't make more use of, of that. But it, it, there is some independent code that tries to, to do that. But I think thinking about the AR64 backend, that isn't something that we want because we, our uh, mem copy mem move doesn't follow this constraint on device memory. We want to do overlapping loads and stores, or maybe you want to use your um, vector instruction set for certain sizes of mem copy and not for others. So pulling it to the independent code gen level is, makes as much sense to me as trying to pull the glibc mem copy to a generic level. Right, your your target stuff is what makes it go fast. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, a reason to uh, uh, have this specific to R6000 is that it is specific to R6000. It's not just uh, the actual machine instructions you generate, but a very important part is also uh, uh, what kind of code, what kind of loop, whatever you generate in these cases. And that gives you like hundreds of cases you would do it if you want to do this architecture independent, it won't really work. I guess that point you've just made is what makes me nervous about expanding this for, so we, in ARH64, we do it for fixed size mem copies and mem moves. Expanding it to more um, variable size removes our ability to ifunk as we change microarchitecture. And I wouldn't want too many binaries kicking about with a version of mem copy that we decided was great for GCC 10, but that two years later is no longer representative. Yeah, this is this is this is definitely true. But I, yeah, I mean, a lot of times you don't necessarily get the case. I think where you have an old binary and maybe a newer glibc that might have an ifunk that is more optimized to the current hardware. I don't know. I, I, uh, you also only put in the code that is a big improvement over the GLIPC, GLIPC one. 
not not if it's if it's only twenty percent fast or anything. So, yeah, right. So you, in 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 just a few year or what years or whatever, uh, you're not gonna see your code be slower than the library version. It's right. not gonna happen. Everything on your graph from sixty four bytes down got me really excited, and the rest I was like, eh, GLBC is fine. It, it, exactly, and right, and so, and and like most of, for most of this, it is just like it's that. It's that you know short a few bytes to 32 to 64 bytes. That's really because I mean there is a big, it's a big game doing it there. So yeah. Right, and that's where your branch predictor has not really got the time to really get going. And it's right, exactly. But I mean, if you can if you copies, can cheat yeah. by by sort of specif making these specific, right? By calling out, okay, I've got to expand it here, and now it's just this one this one string compare instance in its branches, the branch. Predictor can go to work on that and, and get something as opposed to just getting noise because it's every string compare everywhere. Yep. Yes, sir. One thing that might be target independent is uh, replacing memcomp with something that doesn't pro provide an ordered comparison. Have you looked at that? Um. I think uh, uh, because you work on the RTL level, it probably gets optimized away in your case. But that there, might. Yeah, um, you know what? There is some independent code that tries to do that. And I'm trying to remember whether, I think we don't see that at the level of the things where we're, that we're expanding. But that is something that we could, could do there because yeah. it, it makes the distinction in the independent code if it sees like a string comparer that's just being compared to zero. It, that's a special case there, but I don't think we pipe that down into because that that would that would definitely simplify some of the generated code. You could get rid of three four instructions there. Yeah, and it also helps uh, I, when I looked at and on the glibc side uh, when I look at this on the glibc side, side, admittedly not for power. Um, actually, the the determining the ordered result was pretty expensive. Because it, uh, if you have a branch in there, it's, it's totally data dependent, and if you can skip that, that that could be. I mean, for your vector code, it's probably not an issue, but uh, it's still in instructions you probably don't need in all cases. Yeah, in, in the, I mean, in the case where you've got, if you've got like eight bytes to compare, if you're on, if you're on P nine, you can do. You can just do the compare, and then there's that set B instruction that produ produces a minus one, zero, or one result based just on the comparison, the, the comparison code register, right? So it, there's no branch to do yeah. that. But you still uh, you could get rid of the set B instruction and use the comparison result. You could use the comparison result directly, yeah. and, and in P8 in, and before you didn't have that set B, and so then. There's this whole the whole nonsense I alluded to about you know if you've subtracted two 64-bit mm. values and you need a 32-bit result to meet the semantics of you know mem compare, right? Uh, at least Clang is doing something that you just described. Instead of using mem compare, it's routing to b compare when the the comparison is ordered. Yeah, I didn't know. That. There's already an, a predefined function that has the required semantics. I was uh, thinking about having another entry point in glibc where we have that optimized. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, without the tail. The claim check. guys that did these optimizations. The idea is to also push glibc optimizations in the future. Ah, interesting. Thanks. So yeah, all 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 things that could be could be done, and and it's just like it's a low hanging fruit question, right? It's like what's the next what's the next thing I could spend time on that makes the most difference? And I mean, to me, that seems like cracking the, the mem, doing some some sort some work on the mem copy mem move thing felt like the next thing I could uh, I could sink my teeth into that would make a better difference because we do some expansion for mem copy now for power, but it's not. It's not great code, so, um, and we could do. In, in, ironically, the code that we generate could be a mem move, but it isn't used for mem move. So, 
<laughs> that seemed like it was pretty stupid. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, this this specialization for just an unordered, is it zero or not, that we'd have to figure out how that could get communicated to the, these patterns. Because it would be nice not to have to write a whole separate pattern for that, although I suppose you can you could kind of abstract that by just having two patterns. One is unordered and the other versus the ordered one, and they both just call the same expander function with more arguments. I think you should uh, first see uh, uh, what code it actually ends up with now, right? Yeah. Uh, because most of it will it, be it optimized. It could be the RTL optimization get, yeah. can get rid of that stuff at the end. Because I mean, the, this is the, this is the great thing about having doing this in expand is that the, all the back end stuff, you know, when we do CSE and a bunch of other stuff back there, right? So yeah. they c it can get rid of things that are unnecessary because of the you know, well, and, and actually that's why the the, yeah. the 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 ranges <laughs> talk this morning got me thinking about some of this stuff too because I kind of wonder if I could ask some interesting questions about ranges to Why? to simplify some of the code that I generate. So maybe you already asked this, uh, answered this, sorry, uh, when you mentioned uh, stuff in GCC, which I couldn't actually get. But one of the things that we, well, I uh, used to see when I was working on these functions is that we usually have two two reasons to have that code that you load eight bytes or and then four bytes and then two bytes. and it's because of page alignment or because of, in, in the case of, of uh, stern, uh, stern, string compare, you, you want to understand which of the bytes is, is correct. So it's a tail uh, determining which of the bytes is, is different. So you, you also mentioned um, vector, the, the use of vector instructions. But then you said that you didn't have to do any of those load four by eight bytes and then four bytes. But we, we had to. So do you think we might have did the wrong thing and then we could just copy your code to, into, G, into glibc? Because uh, I really remember that this was uh, the reason why uh, small com uh, string, compare, uh, string copies with small inputs were a problem for us. And you didn't seem to have this problem, right? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things may be that glibc has to be everything to everybody. Yeah. And so the problem yeah. is, the, the like the overlapping the overlapping compares that. thing that I did like I said that does not perform well on P7 and earlier, so yeah. you may not be able to get away with that in glibc necessarily. The performance uh, is not very nice. So, <laughs> the, you know that was one thing. I mean, actually, the 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 page, the page crossing thing. I just punt and, <laughs> and give it to glibc at that point, right? Because I don't want to. I don't want to have to inline generate the code that tries to figure out, okay, I'm walking up to the page boundary, and then if it's equal at that point, then I continue on. That would be generating too much code inline. So it's just, is it going to cross the page boundary? If it is, just let the glibc code handle that and, and, and move on to fight another day. But, I mean, I think the primary reason why you could, you could maybe put, take the code that I've got here and put that into an iFunk for a specific architecture um, because, I mean, that's the thing is when I'm generating, when I say I'm generating code for P9, I mean, this is the code when you tell power, or tell GCC dash MCPU equal power nine, right? And so that means the user said, I want code that is going to be best on a power nine. And I don't care how it runs or, you know, it isn't gonna run at all on something older and it might not be optimal on something newer. But this is what I, I asked for, and so it, it's legitimate in that case for me to, <laughs> to do tricky stuff like this that, you, you know, I mean, it would also equally be legitimate for glibc to do in an ifunk that's for a specific architecture, right? So you could, you could definitely copy the code sequences and do that. Yeah, and, and so you, you, didn't, you didn't bail out to glibc when this, the string was too small, right? You only bail out to glibc when you were, when you maybe might be, uh, having a page boundary crossing, right? Right. Okay, so yeah. then there's maybe something that we could copy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, being able to have the unaligned, the unaligned loads is a big deal for short, 
comparisons as well because if you don't if you don't have the ability to have unaligned load then you need to you know do several shifts and things to get stuff yeah so and uh, adding a comment uh, when Aaron laughed at my reaction uh, to the string compare case it's exactly because um, I noticed that it was going up for larger sizes was going to to twice as fast as glibc which in my opinion shows that we can improve uh, the performance there. So yeah, that, that's one place that where we could copy code, maybe. Uh, I don't know, we need to, to take a look. But I also think this could also, uh, these optimizations could help us to improve uh, performance of code written in C so that we could treat only those special cases in assembly and leave code written in C and still get uh, uh, the same performance. So what you're saying is use the built-in expansion inside of glibc? Yes. <laughs> okay. That sounds, that sounds crazy to me, but <laughs> if you think it'll work. <laughs> yeah, need I, to try. Yeah, it'll be worth a try. Well, uh, we for at the end of the questions, I think we're about ten minutes to the hour, so we could uh, call it a day. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Thanks.